Chapter 18 Hadassah felt foreboding as Julia's wedding day approached. From the moment Decimus Valerian agreed to a compensio marriage, Julia seemed more subtle than happy. Even as Hadassah wondered why the master suggested bride price rather than the binding confratio, Julia stood before the gathering of friends and made the traditional statement, Ubi tu Gaius and Ogaia. Where you are master, I am mistress. Upon her pronouncement, Caius Polonius Urbanus kissed her and sealed the engagement with an iron ring. Hadassah could understand why Julia was in love with him. Urbanus was a handsome man with a vital presence and charming manner. Decimus and Phoebe both approved of him. Still, though Hadassah had no facts or foundation for what she felt, she was convinced that something dark and sinister was beneath the man's smooth facade. Whenever Caius looked at her, she felt chilled by that dark, unblinking stare. She had no one in whom she could confide her feelings. Marcus had gone away on business and wasn't due for another month. If he were here, she might gather the courage to talk to him about it. But by the time he returned, it would be too late. The priests had already been consulted, and a lucky day set for the wedding. Julia would be married before her brother returned home. "'Surely you want your brother to be at your wedding,' Hadassah said. "'Of course I would like him to be at my wedding,' she said. "'But the priest said the second Wednesday of April is our lucky day. "'Delaying the wedding would defy the gods and risk disaster. "'Besides, I can't wait another week, let alone a month. "'Marcus could be delayed, or he could change his plans.' "'She sank down into the warm water of her scented bath and smiled. "'Besides, Marcus has seen me get married once already. "'He was born at my last wedding.' I don't imagine he would find this one any more interesting. Everyone seemed so pleased with the arrangements that Hadassah began to wonder if she was misjudging Urbanus. He spent hours with Decimus, discussing foreign trade and politics. They seemed to agree about almost everything. As for Phoebe, she was charmed by her future son-in-law. Even the household slaves thought the gods had smiled on Julia by making Urbanus fall in love with her. Yet, it was as though Hadassah's soul caught a glimpse of something malevolent and dangerous hidden beneath the polished manners and good looks. The morning of the wedding, Julia was tense with excitement and determined to look more beautiful than she had ever looked before. Hadassah spent several hours arranging her hair in an elaborate style of curls and braids interwoven with a strand of rare and expensive pearls. Julia's wedding palace was of the finest white flannel, and encircling her small waist was a woolen girdle fastened with a Herculean knot for good luck. Hadassah slipped the orange shoes on her mistress's small feet, "'You are very beautiful,' Phoebe said, and her eyes misted with tears of pride. She took her daughter's hand and sat with her on the bed. "'Are you afraid?' "'No, mother,' she said, amused at the worry she saw in her mother's eyes. If only she knew. She was eager for Caius, so eager she could hardly bear it. It was not her unwillingness that had kept her from his bed, but Caius' own sense of honor. With tender care, Phoebe arranged the orange veil over Julia's head so that only the left side of her face was revealed. She gave her three copper coins. One for your husband, and two for your household gods, she said, and kissed her daughter's cheek. May the gods bless you with children. Oh, mother, please. May the gods wait on that blessing. Julia laughed happily. I'm too young to be tied down by children. Hadassah stood at the back of the gathering in the temple as Caius and Julia's hands were joined. She could hear the keening squeal of the terrified pig as it was dragged before the altar. It thrashed violently as its throat was slit and its blood poured down over the altar as a holy sacrifice for the bride and groom. Feeling faint with nausea, Hadassah fled outside. Shaking, she sat down upon the high step near the door, where she could hear the marriage contract read, but not see or smell the blood. She put her head on her raised knees and listened to the droning voice of the priest as he read the documents that had more to do with dowry obligations than a lifetime commitment to love one another. Hadassah was saddened. Clenching her hands, she prayed fervently for her mistress. As the procession of guests passed, she rose to follow. Most of those attending the wedding were there purely out of social obligation to Decimus Valerian, their patron. Few who knew Julia had any fondness for her. The guests accompanied the couple to Caius' villa on the far side of the Palatine, where his slaves had prepared a feast. Julia rubbed oil on the doorposts and hung up a garland of wool. She presented Caius with one of the copper coins— he gave her an offering of fire and water, thus relinquishing control of his household to his new wife. Hadassah helped serve at the elaborate feast that followed, marveling at how different the atmosphere was from the celebratory meal of Julia's first wedding. Caius' friends made ribald comments, and there was much laughter. Julia was radiant, blushing and laughing when her new husband leaned close and whispered in her ear. 
Perhaps everything would be all right. Perhaps she was wrong about Urbanus. Summoned to the kitchen, Hadassah was handed a silver tray of goose liver molded into a horrific beast with exaggerated genitals. Mortified at the obscene offering, she clanged the tray back onto the counter and drew back from it in revulsion. What's the matter with you? If you've done damage to my work, I'll have the hide flogged off of you. The master asked expressly for that dish. Now take it out and serve it to your mistress. No, she said without thinking, horrified at the very idea of offering something so grotesque to Julia. The blow the cook gave her sent her back against the cupboard. You take it, he ordered another, who obeyed with alacrity. He turned on her again, and she drew back with a gasp of fear, her face throbbing with pain. Pick up the tray over there, and serve it to the guests, now. Trembling, she went. Relieved to see it was only a large tray of a dozen small partridges, browned and glistening with a honey and spice glaze. Her head was still ringing when she entered the large banquet room. Guests laughed and encouraged Julia as Caius dipped his fingers into the dragon and offered it to his bride. Julia laughed gaily and licked it from his fingers. Second, Hadassah turned to the guests farthest away from the scene and offered the partridges. Several men called for the bride and groom to be sent off to the bed. Caius caught Julia up in his arms and carried her out of the room. With Caius and Julia gone, some of the guests began departing. Drusus helped an ashen and tearful Octavia from her couch. She was drunk and scarcely able to walk. Decimus rose from a couch of honor and helped Phoebe to her feet. She beckoned Hadassah. You are returning to the villa with us. Caius told us he's arranged for servants for Julia already and has released you from her duties to her. She touched her arm. You needn't look distressed, Tadassa. If Julia needs you, you know she will send for you. In the meantime, I have duties in mind for you. Hadassa settled quickly into her new duties, and she delighted in serving Phoebe. They enjoyed spending hours in the gardens working in the flower beds or in the weaving room with the looms. Hadassa loved working in the garden the most, for she enjoyed the pathways and trellises that were budding with the coming spring. She loved the feel of the soil beneath her hands and the scent of flowers drifting in the fresh air. Birds flitted between the trees and pecked at the seed Phoebe placed on open feeders for them. Decimus joined them occasionally, sitting on a marble bench and smiling wearily as he talked with Phoebe and watched her work. He seemed somewhat improved, for which Bithyak claimed credit. However, he was not regaining his strength. Phoebe felt he was improved because he was under far less strain now that Julia was happily settled with a husband but he was not cured from whatever ailed him. Phoebe lost faith in the Egyptian girl's healing arts and stopped summoning her to minister to Decimus. She called upon Hadassah instead. Sing to us, Hadassah. Hadassah stroked the small harp and sang psalms her father had taught her back in Galilee. Closing her eyes, she could pretend she was back there again, with the smell of the sea and the sounds of the fishermen calling to one another. For a brief time, she could forget all the horror of the things that had happened since that last journey to Jerusalem. Sometimes she sang lullabies her mother had sung to her and her little sister, Leah. Sweet Leah, how she missed her. At times, when the night was dark and silent, she would think how Leah had closed her eyes and mind to the horrors of this cruel world and gone peacefully to be with God. She would remember the piercingly sweet memories of running free through the lilies of the field with her little sister, laughing at how Leah bounded through the high grasses like a rabbit. Hadassah found pleasure in serving the Valerians, especially Phoebe, who reminded her somewhat of her own mother as she sought the needs of the household with simple efficiency. Just as her own mother had spent an hour in devotions to Jesus upon first arising, Phoebe went into her larium and worshipped her household gods. She placed fresh wafers on the altars, replenished the incense, and lit the burners to send up a pleasing aroma to her many stone gods. Her prayers were no less sincere, however misplaced her faith. Marcus entered Rome with a powerful feeling of homecoming. He was well satisfied with the results of his weeks of travel, having made agreements with several of the merchants with whom his father had dealt in the past. Before going home, he went to the baths, eager to wash away the road dust and have a masseur knead away the ache of weeks of travel. Antigonus was in the tepidarium, soaking in the warm water, with a retinue of sycophants. Marcus ignored them as a slave rinsed him with warm water. He went down into the water with a sigh and leaned back against the edge, closing his eyes and allowing the water to soothe him. Antigonus waved his friends away and joined him. We've been gone a long time, Marcus. Was your journey profitable? They talked a few moments about trade and the Roman demand for more goods. I saw Julia the other evening with her new husband, Antigonus said. Marcus' eyes shot open. Her what? By the gods, you don't know, he said. 
I take it you haven't even seen your family yet. Well, let me enlighten you about events that occurred while you were away. Your lovely sister married Caius Polonius Urbanus several weeks ago. I wasn't invited, since I don't know the gentleman. Do you know him? No, a pity. Everyone is curious about Urbanus, but no one knows much about him other than he appears to have a lot of money. How he gained it is a great mystery. He spends most of his time at the games. Rumor has it that he was Caliba Shiva Fontanius' lover. You will excuse me, Antigonus. Marcus left the pool hastily. He went straight home and found his father in the triclinium with his mother. With a soft exhalation of joy, his mother came and embraced him. He was shocked at the new gray at his father's temples and at his lack of weight. I stopped at the baths and saw Antigonus, he said, taking a couch and accepting a goblet of wine Enoch poured for him. And he told you Eutulia is married, Decimus said, seeing the glitter of anger in his son's eyes. It's unfortunate you didn't come home and hear it from us first. When did all this take place? Several weeks ago, Phoebe said, turning the tray of sliced beef so the choicest pieces were nearest him. Eat something, Marcus. You look thinner than last we saw you. What do you know about this man? Marcus said, uninterested in food. He deals in foreign goods and arranges trade with the northern frontiers, Decimus said. He poured himself some more wine. Other than that, my agents could find out very little about him. And you allowed Julia to marry him with so little information? We inquired about Caius and learned what we could. We invited Caius here numerous times and found him to be intelligent, charming, educated. Your sister is in love with him, and for all appearances, he is equally in love with her. Or her money. Decimus raised an eyebrow. Is that what's really angering you about all this? Not that you missed Julia's wedding, but that you'll have to relinquish control of Claudius' estate? Stung. Marcus set the goblet down with a thump. If you'll remember, he said tightly, I took on the responsibility because you were in Ephesus. When you returned, you told me to continue administering the estate. I've taken not one denarius profit from anything I've done for her. Decimus sighed. I apologize. Your concern has always been noted. I loved you in control because your decisions were sound. Julia's estate was safe in your hands. But the burden of that responsibility is now lifted. Not so fast, father. I won't relinquish control until I'm certain this husband of Julius isn't a wastrel. You've no legal right to retain control of her estate, Decimus said firmly. When Caius Polonius Urbanus took your sister as his wife, he took possession of everything she owns as well, and that includes Claudius' estate. Marcus thought of Hadassah and felt an uncomfortable feeling coil in his stomach. She was one of Julius' possessions. Who was this Urbanus, and what would he feel toward his new wife's Jewish maid? Embarrassed by his feelings for a slave girl, he hid behind his concerns for Julia. And if she wants to leave the financial arrangements as they are, it's no longer Julia's right to make that decision. Phoebe rose and went to Marcus. Once you've seen how happy she is with Caius, you'll feel easier about your father's giving approval to the marriage. Marcus went to see Julia the next afternoon. She was still in bed when he arrived at Urbana's villa, but upon being told her brother had come, she wasted no time in joining him. Marcus, she cried, flinging herself into his arms. Oh, I'm so glad to see you. He was surprised to see her so disheveled. Her waist-length hair was unbrushed, her face devoid of makeup. She looked tired and was trembling, as though suffering the after-effects of heavy drinking. A small, round red mark showed on her neck, disturbing evidence of passion. He looked down at her, concerned. Imagine my surprise when I returned to the news that you were married. Julia laughed gaily. I'm sorry, but I couldn't wait for you. You'd already been gone two months and sent no word back about how soon we could expect you. You'll like Caius. You have much in common with him. He adores the games. How did you meet him? Her smile turned mischievous. Caliba introduced us. His mouth tightened at her ready admission of defying him and father. That's hardly a recommendation. Julia let go of his hands and moved away from him. I'm sorry you don't approve of her, Marcus, but it makes absolutely no difference to me. She turned and faced him, angry and defensive. I can do as I wish now. I no longer need father's permission, or yours, to choose my friends. Marcus could see Caliba's influence. I didn't come to argue with you. I came to see if you were happy. Her chin jerked up. I assure you I am. I'm happier now than I've ever been in my life. Indeed. I'm joyous to hear it, he said with unveiled annoyance. You have my congratulations for escaping our clutches and my apologies for intruding on your newfound freedom. Julia's defiance evaporated at his anger, and she hurried to stop him from leaving. 
Oh, Marcus, don't be so impossible. You've only just come to see me. Don't stalk off. I couldn't bear it. She hugged him as she always had from the time she was a small child who idolized him. He softened for a moment. She went on, drawing back slightly. You only disapprove of Caliba because you don't know her as I do. She took his hands in hers. I'm not like mother. You know that. I'm not content to weave and see that everyone else's needs above my own. I want excitement the way you do, Marcus. The gods brought Caius and me together. He searched his sister's face, looking for the radiance of a young bride, and saw it along with the exhaustion of a debauched lifestyle. He caressed her cheek. Are you really happy? Oh, I am. Caius is so handsome and exciting. When he's not here, all I can think about is him and when he'll be back again. She blushed. Don't look at me that way, she said, laughing. Come and sit with me in the parasile. I haven't eaten yet, and I'm starving. She snapped her fingers and ordered one of the servants to have a meal brought to her. Julia talked about the parties she and Caius attended, the sort that had always appealed to Aria. I saw Aria the other evening, Julia said as though reading his thoughts. She asked who you were seeing. She had a gladiator in tow. He had scars all over him and was quite ugly. She complained about what the servant brought her, telling her to go back for fresh fruit and bread. I miss Hadassah, she said in annoyance. She always knew what I wanted. These mates are so stupid and slow. What did you do with her? Marcus asked as carefully as he could. His heart was beating fast, and a cold sweat was breaking out over his body. Caius doesn't like Jews because they're so prudish. Besides that, he didn't like her because she was homely. Urbanus arrived before Marcus could ask any questions. Julia rose quickly when she saw him and raced to him. He kissed her briefly, looking her over with a wry smile and whispered in her ear. Julia shrank slightly and then turned back. Marcus, this is Caius. I'll leave you two alone and make myself more presentable. She hurried off, leaving Marcus alone with her new husband. You must wonder at the life we lead when your sister greets you straight from our bed, Caius said, strolling toward him. It was obvious to Marcus why Julia had fallen in love with Urbanus. He was the sort of man many women went mad over, dark, well-built, exuding sexuality. His enigmatic smile was challenging. Marcus met it with a smile of his own, stifling the urge to demand what he had done with Hadassah. Julia speaks of you often, Urbana said. One would think you were descended from the gods. He leaned against one of the marble pillars, his gaze cool. Younger sisters have a way of idolizing older brothers. There's considerable difference in your ages. We lost two brothers to fevers. She doesn't mention them. She didn't know them. Have you any family, Caius? Caius straightened and walked along the edge of the pond. The only sound for a long moment was the sprinkle of the fountain. No, he said simply. Not until I marry Julia. He smiled, and Marcus wasn't sure he liked what he saw on Caius' face. Your mother and father welcomed me with open arms, he went on, looking at Marcus steadily. I'll reserve my welcome until I know you better. Caius laughed. An honest man, he said. Refreshing. A servant entered the peristyle and offered Urbanus wine. At his nod, the slave turned to Marcus. He declined. Urbanus sipped his wine for a moment, studying Marcus over the rim of his silver goblet. I understand you've been managing Julia's estate. Would you like an accounting? At your convenience. Caius lowered his goblet. From all I'd heard about you, I thought you wouldn't be so agreeable about it. You're my sister's husband. The burden of her estate now falls upon you. Indeed, it's a lot of money. His dark eyes lit with amusement. Marcus wondered how Caius knew what was involved. Even Julia didn't know. Perhaps Father had laid out the details, but Marcus doubted it. Father would have left it to him. Perhaps we could work something out between us, Caius said slowly. You could continue to manage the estate and pay over an established portion each month. Very neat, Marcus thought cynically. I usually charge a fee for my services, he said dryly, having no intention of becoming Urbana's lackey. Even to your own family, Caius said mockingly. A percentage of the profits, Marcus returned smoothly. A sizable percentage. Caius laughed softly. I was just curious to see what you'd say. I'm fully capable of managing things myself. You know, Marcus, you and I have a great deal in common. So Julia said a little while ago. He liked hearing it from Urbanus even less. Marcus stayed only as long as was polite. Julia returned to the parasile dressed in an expensive fine wool palace. She wore pearls around her neck and woven into the curls piled high on her head. Aren't they beautiful? She said, fingering her pearls and showing them off to him. 
They were the most expensive baubles a woman could have. Caius gave them to me on our wedding night. The dark circles beneath her eyes were covered skillfully by makeup, and pink blushes had been added to her pale cheeks and her mouth. Had he not seen her an hour before, he wouldn't have known she was tired and hung over from whatever party Urbanus had taken her to the night before. Her animated chatter grated, and Urbanus' teasing was full of innuendo, which made her laugh. Unable to stomach any more, Marcus made his excuses and left. Returning home, he was depressed. When he entered the house, he handed his cloak to Enoch. He heard his father's voice in the common room where he met with his patrons each morning and went to join him. Hadaza, he said, seeing her standing before his father and mother. As soon as he said it, he was embarrassed. What's going on? Decimus glanced up at his son and saw an expression on his face that he had never seen before. Bethia has accused Hadassa of stealing. Decimus had been unable to make sense of the accusation until now. He noted with increasing interest that Marcus scarcely noticed the Egyptian slave. Indeed, he seemed to have eyes for none but Hadassah. Stealing, Marcus said, pulling his gaze away from Hadassah as he entered the room. His heart sank. He looked at Bithia and saw her dark eyes glittering with emotion. He had seen that look often enough in Aria's eyes to recognize it. She was burning with jealousy over something. Has Bithia any proof? He said coldly. We were just getting around to that, Decimus said. Phoebe sat pale and distraught in the seat next to him. Hadassah stood silently before him, her head bowed. She had made no outburst of defense. In fact, thus far, she had said nothing at all. What proof do you have against Hadassah? He demanded of the Egyptian girl. I saw her with my own eyes, Bithia said insistently and named two other household slaves who could corroborate her story. Decimus called them in, and they said, yes, they had seen Hadassah giving coin to a woman in the marketplace. Marcus couldn't believe what he was hearing. Bithia looked smug and unpleasant as the other testimonies agreed with hers. He felt a rush of deep dislike for her and wondered what he had ever found desirable about her in the first place. Hadassa, Decimus said grimly. She looked up, frightened and pale. Is it true? Did you give coin to someone in the marketplace? Yes, my lord. Decimus wished she had lied. He sighed heavily. He was going to have to flog her, and he wondered if her slender body could stand up to the punishment. He didn't like the look on Bithia's face. He suspected the Egyptian resented Hadassah being called to serve them now instead of her. Leave us, Bithia. If he was going to be forced to punish Hadassah, he wasn't going to do it before a gloating slave. He dismissed the others as well. You know the penalty for theft is flogging, Decimus said. Hadassah seemed to shrink, though she made no defense. Phoebe was growing more and more distraught. Decimus, I can't believe she's stolen from us. She's always given a full accounting. He raised his hand imperiously, and she fell silent. He was furious to be placed in this position, and addressed himself to Hadassah. We warn every slave that comes into our home what the penalty is for theft. What possessed you to give away money your mistress entrusted to you? I only gave away the coin you gave me, my lord. Coin I gave you? He said, frowning. The peculium, my lord. Decimus blinked. Each morning he sat in his curled chair and doled out coin to his dozens of patrons. He also gave a quadrant to each of the least of the slaves, more to Enoch and the cook. He could scarcely believe a slave would give her peculium away. Phoebe leaned close again and laid her hand on his arm. Hadassah has always accounted for every coin I've given her. Frowning, he studied Hadassah intently. Have you ever given away any of the money your mistress has given you? No, my lord. Only what you've given me is peculium. But why would you give your peculium away? I had no need for it, my lord, and the woman did. What woman was this? A woman on the street. Marcus came closer, astonished by what she was saying. You're a slave with nothing. The peculium is all the money you'll ever have. Why didn't you keep it for yourself? She kept her eyes properly lowered. I have food to eat, my lord, a warm place to sleep, clothes to cover me. The woman had none of these things. Her husband died a few months ago, and her son is a legionnaire on the frontier of Germania. Decimus stared. You, a Jew, give money to a Roman? She looked up at him then, tears in her eyes. She was trembling in fear of him, but wanted him to understand. She was hungry, my lord. The quadrants you gave me was enough to buy her bread. Decimus leaned back, amazed. That a slave with a few coins would give it all to an enemy of her people was inconceivable to him. You may leave us, Hadassa. The peculium is yours to do with as you like. Give it to whomever you please. Thank you, my lord. He watched her leave the room, then glanced at Phoebe and saw her eyes were filled with tears. He took her hand. She looked at him. 
If Bithia makes further accusations, Decimus, I would like your permission to sell her. Sell her now, if you wish, he said, then glanced at Marcus. Unless you'd like to take her along to warm the bed at your villa. Marcus hadn't realized his father was so aware of his private affairs, nor that he was willing to discuss them openly before mother. Thank you, but no, I want nothing more to do with her. Do as you wish, he told Phoebe. She rose and left the room. Father and son looked at one another. Marcus' mouth tightened. Bethia came to my room of her own volition the first time. I'm sure she did, but I doubt Hadassah will ever behave in the same manner. Marcus stiffened, his eyes flashing. Meaning what? You know very well what I mean, he said. He sighed again. Julia returned her to us because her banished dislikes prudish Jews. Marcus interrupted with sarcasm. Decimus' eyebrows flickered, but he made no comment to that surprising disclosure. He had wondered why Hadassah had been sent back. I seem to remember your having similar reservations when your mother bought her. You said she might hold a grudge against all Romans. You also said she was ugly, as I remember. It was clear Marcus didn't like being reminded. Decimus smiled tightly. The fact is, Julia has returned her, and Hadassah is now beneath my protection. Marcus laughed at the amazing declaration. And now you want me to keep my hands off of her, he said, attempting humor but failing to conceal the edge in his voice. Decimus said nothing for a moment his gaze steady and coolly assessing. "'Your emotions are running high over her,' he said, and saw that his choice of words discomforted Marcus even more. "'I don't believe you've used Hadassah,' he raised his brow, half in question. "'No,' Marcus said firmly. "'I haven't used her, father.' It was a disquieting choice of words. "'I've never forced a woman to do my will. "'There are other means of force besides physical, as you well know. "'You are master. She is slave.' Your mother has never approved of your dalliance with Bithia or the others you had before her. And frankly, I never thought much about it before now. You're young and vital, Marcus. Women have always been attracted to you. It seemed only natural you'd take your pleasure. He rose from his curled chair and stepped down from the dice to stand before his son. But this girl is different. He shook his head, still amazed and perplexed. After all Adassa has been through, she gives everything she has to a Roman woman, the mother of a legionnaire. He shook his head again and let out a soft breath. He looked at Marcus. Hadassah isn't like the others, Marcus. She's not like anyone we've ever owned before. She was not like anyone he had ever known. Reaching out, Decimus gripped Marcus' arm, at once commanding and appealing. Take your pleasure with the others, but leave this girl alone. After his father had left the room, Marcus sat on the edge of the dice and raked a hand back through his hair. He had made no promises. How could he when Hadassah was all he thought about?